Now, education is something that many of us in the developed world take for granted, but for millions of children globally, an education could be their ticket out of poverty. In sub-Saharan Africa, 32 million children have never been to school and simply don't have basic reading abilities. Well, Project Hello World aims to create digital schools so that children without access to formal schooling can access this through the internet, and I'm delighted to say I'm joined by the founder and director of the project, Katrin McMillan. Welcome to This Day Live. I suppose the first thing I want to ask you is, um, with so many children in rural areas not being able to access school, you're bravely going down the digital route, but in some of those areas there's no electricity, so how on earth do you access the internet? Well, the, we build what are called Hello Hubs, so they're outdoor, solar-powered, internet-enabled computer kiosks with large touch screens and rugged keypads, so they're totally energy autonomous. Right. And obviously, um, solar power, that's not cheap. So how do you go about funding a project like that? Is it purely on donations? It is. Projects for All is the charity. It's a UK and a US uh, registered charity. And Project Hello World is our main project at the moment. And we're funded by foundations and philanthropists. So Project World, as I understand it, Hello World, um, started 15 months ago. Yeah. And you have a pilot running in Nigeria. Tell me about that pilot. We launched in Nigeria um, yeah, 15 months ago. Uh, and we built a Hello hub in Suleja, which is about an hour and 45 minutes north of the capital city. Um, and uh, it's we've been testing it for a year to see what data comes back to figure out how the kids use the internet when they get online for the first time, what kind of edu educational software they're interested in, and what happens when children can become autodidactic. And this year, we're ready to roll it out to more countries and more locations. And what age group are we talking? Primary school or older than that? It's right through. We're, um, the youngest users are about, the youngest regular users are about two years old, and they sit on the knees of their brothers and sisters, and it's, each screen has a kind of semicircular bench with on average about 18 children using a screen at a time and so they teach each other how to get online and how to use these games and how to learn to type so the little ones are about two and we've got people right through uh, to higher education and adults parents using it as well so is it numeracy and literacy and what kind of level of education are they likely to come at, come away with well, I think the possibilities are really limitless. Um, the work is based on Sugata Mitra's Hole in the Wall project. He won the TED Prize in 2013 for his 10 years of research into um, how children can learn with access to the internet. The first thing they do when they get online is they teach themselves to type. I think they identify really quickly that in order to navigate the system, they have to be able to use the keypad, use the touch screen. And after that, they start playing um, numeracy games, literacy games. In the future rollouts, we'll get a baseline test of what their literacy is when they begin and how they progress through the system. Um, but they, uh, we've had cases of children looking up quantum physics in a second language within months. So the possibilities really are limitless in my view. I mean, it is, it is absolutely fantastic that you, these children are being given this opportunity. But again, um, if you look at rural areas in the developing world um, and you look at families, they have many children and that's mainly because mum and dad go out to work and they need the kids either to look after their other brothers and sisters or to work the land. So how do you convince adults within those community that education is important? Because many of the older generation will say they don't need to be able to read and write because they're going to take over the, the family farm or they're going to continue doing what their, what their ancestors have been doing for centuries. Every community that I've lived and worked in across Africa um, has identified two things. And the first is that they want their children to have a better life than they have had. And when you really drill down into what that means and what the possibilities are, they'll say that they need to be able to participate in the economy. And in order to do that, they'll identify education. So I think that most parents do want their children to be able to make more money, to have a better life, and therefore to be able to read and write. The other thing that they very often tell me is that they want to tell their story. And I think that that's um, a really significant part of Project Hello World. It's, a, it's also about community-led, non-partisan journalism, so that people can um, share their news, tell their story, connect with the world, host a radio station, um, make movies, edit movies, share their photos. So I think those two issues have always been actually critical to almost every community I've worked with. But I think the other part of um, 
getting parents and adults um, and senior members of the community on board is making it relevant across the community. So there are no limits to access. It's for grandmothers and grandfathers as much as parents and children as well. And in that way, we believe that um, the system is safe and will be protected because it's relevant and useful to everyone. Some of these villages have, you know, lots of, you know, hundreds of people. So how do kids get into these hubs? I mean, how many children can access one hub at any particular time and how many, how many people can benefit from that? Sulejia, where we launched, it has a population of, um, well, there are varying reports, but perhaps five million. So wow. it, it, it's a large town. Um, the hub is Wi-Fi enabled. So if you have a personal device, you can also be near the hub to use that. It has charging stations so you can charge your personal devices. Um, we've discovered that people, that children and adults sharing a, sc a screen is more beneficial to their learning than working alone on a tablet. They teach each other and they mm -hmm. compete and show off. Um, but there's definitely scope to build many more in this So how many, how many benefit at any one time and how long do they spend online? There so. are sometimes hundreds of people around the hub. Um, it's self-organised, so we don't dictate how, many, um, how long any one user can use the system. And uh, the questions when we were building were often about that. How long can I stay? Mm -hmm. And we've, we said, it, I don't know. It's up to the community. It's up to you to decide who has access and how long they have access for and to make it fair. And what about so. security? Again, because, you know, in these, in these poverty-stricken areas this could potentially be a magnet for people to rip off the solar panels and try yeah. and flog them to earn some money yeah there's a lot of really valuable equipment yeah. um, in a hello hub the way that we work is that we don't build a hello hub the community builds it themselves with our support and we also ask them to make an investment in the system whatever they can invest so it might be helping us negotiate for the solar labor certainly to dig the holes and put in the steel negotiating for the steel feeding the children putting us up helping with transport um, and we invite people from across the community to participate and and we feel and we um, are seeing that when a community invests in a project in this way um, and when they build it and understand it they are um, interested in protecting it and th th there's no system that you couldn't tear down rip, rip apart and sell for its component parts but if it's worth more to a community assembled and connected to the internet then they'll look after it and what about things I mean you, you started in Nigeria which is fine but what about when you get to places where let's say there is a bit more um, censorship when it comes to the internet so let's say not in in Nigeria let's say you move to rural areas of China where mm. we all know the internet is highly censored so mm. how do people go about accessing um, education education materials but also wanting to find out what's happening in the wider world because mm. there just won't be that Ability. Mm, no, I mean, it's extremely problematic and worrying censorship on access to the world's body of knowledge and news. We, um, ha we don't have the ability to bypass the laws of a country. Mm -hmm. So we don't censor anything, obviously, and we don't even put parental controls. We leave that up to the... Dis the that was my next question. So things like, you know, parental controls and things like pornography or anything that is, you know, going to, you know, be potentially sensitive to children, mm -hmm. how do you restrict that or can you? Well, it's, if it's legal in the country, um, in our host country, then we don't put restrictions on. But we form community groups, parents groups, teachers groups, and a women's group, and we talk about the dangers out there on the internet, bullying um, and exploitation, uh, and obviously pornography as well, and there's violence and inappropriate content. So we talk about what's out there, and we ask them what they'd like to do about it, and we give them the decision-making authority. It's much less of an issue um, than, than those of us in the West assume it to be, I think. That, that we have a preoccupation here with pornography um, that doesn't exist there. What about um, what, why you chose Nigeria? You're looking at also Uganda, mm -hmm. but why did you decide to, to start in Nigeria? Nigeria has 8.7 million children out of school. It's a quarter of Africa's extreme poor. Boko Haram is actively opposing access to education. It seems like the right place to start. Okay, and you're going to be rolling this out into Uganda and into Peru as well. Yeah, we're, this year we're launching five hubs in Peru, five hubs in Uganda, and we have a commitment to get back to Nigeria with another five hubs. I'm proudest to say that um, we publish our how-to guides, um, both from the community point of view and also the tech, and a group in Nigeria has used that to start building their own in Lagos, and in that way we hope to get to scale. So we, we want people to build their own and use our guides, and we will support them in doing that. And so um, when it comes to 
keeping Hello Project World uh, alive, mm. um, how do you exist? You mentioned donations. So where, where does the money come from? Um, it's, uh, we have foundation sponsors and individual philanthropists, so it's charitable fundraising at the moment. I think f in terms of keeping the project growing and getting to scale, um, open sourcing all of our uh, programming and publishing our guides, we hope that other people will pick up this project and do it too. And if somebody wants to donate, Catherine, where can they do that? It's Projects for All, so it's projectsforall.org. Okay, Catherine McMillan, thank you so much for coming thank in. Thank you for having me.